Hey, what's up, everybody? Isaac here with Civil Engineering Academy coming at you again with another sweet episode of our podcast as well as a YouTube video for those watching. And I wanted today to go over a sweet report, and that is the bum, 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 the NCEES squared report wah, 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 2019. So every once in a while, uh, every year, I should say, not every once in a while, but every year, the NCES produces a report and it goes over some of the numbers um, regarding how many test takers are out there, how many PE, uh, how many people with PEs are out there in the world and uh, well in the united states probably in the world too but we're going to check it out i'm going to go through it with you uh those on the podcast this will be an audio version those that join me on youtube i will flip the screen you won't be seeing my ugly mug anymore but we'll go to the screen and kind of run through the report together but it's going to be a good time and i think you're going to enjoy going through this so um, having said that, the NCES produces these reports, like I said, once a year, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and flip the screen and we will get right to it. So let's do it. All right. So just checking this out. If you go to NCES, uh, you can go grab this report. Just go search for the squared report or head to NCES.org and go grab this. Anyway, I'm headed there right now. And you just click on the report, brings up a nice little PDF. I think one of the beauties of this report is that it's actually like really graphically, to, you know, visually ap appealing. It's really nice looking. Uh, these 3D graphics on the front cover look pretty cool. So it's called the squared report, folks. Okay, that's what it is. And so what it is, is uh, a squared report is basically the reason why they chose the name squared and this is coming right out of the document itself is that it means that they want to be direct honest and in good order the mission of the NCES is to advance licensure for engineering uh, for surveying and in order to safeguard health and well-being and safety of the public so squared is one way that we do that by providing a straightforward account of their you know basically their numbers for the fiscal year so this is uh, data that they put together uh, usually lag so this is basically from what does this say all of the information presented in this report uh, which began October 1st 2018 and ended September 30th 2019 so they call it the 2019 report it comes out in 2020 basically covers what happened through the end of 2018 up to 2019 uh, September of 2019 so it's a good resource it's kind of fun to check out the numbers that are in here kind of give you an insight of what's um, you know what's going on out there in the world of the civil FE the PE and uh, how all of this works so who we are the NCES is uh, basically a nonprofit organization it's the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying and their whole purpose is to advi advance licensure for engineers and surveyors okay that's the, their whole goal um, so it was created in 1920 and it's been working to facilitate mobility for professional engineers and surveyors by providing its member boards with licensing licensees with services that promote uniformly and license laws and all kinds of good stuff so they have here a nice little graphic and it says they have 69 NCEES board members uh, on this and uh, what's interesting is that uh, some board members represent only engineering or surveying. The majority of them represent both and that the boards are multi-professional and they regulate additional professions. So such as like architecture, uh, one board in Illinois regulates structural engineering as a separate license category. So kind of interesting there. Uh, most licensing board members are appointed actually by the governor uh, of the state they're in. And the makeup, makeup of membership varies according to a, a jurisdiction statute. So, you know, required number of professional engineers, surveyors, and public members. So they have 69 NCES board members. They have one that's a structural only, 11 are engineering only, 13 surveying only, 16 multi-professional, and 28 joint engineering surveying 
and then they have that break in, broken up into whether you live in the western area of the U.S., the southern, central, or northeast. So kind of interesting there. There's actually 603 licensing board members. Uh, of those, 255 have the PE only. 141 have the PS only, which is the survey license. 93 are public members. 74 have other licenses of a different variety of professional licenses. And 40 of those have a dual license of PE and PS. So the whole board is ma made up of a variety of people. It's not just engineers there. I thought that was interesting. Uh, talking about the exams next, going through what they have here. In order to develop the exams, they are um, basically developed by engineers and surveyors who volunteer to write and evaluate the problems that are found in the exams. So they had a total of 762 volunteers, and they worked on these exams um, in 49 meetings. It's a lot of meetings. Uh, representing a total of almost 23,000 hours spent developing exam content for the eight fundamentals and 26 professional exam disciplines. So 49 meetings, 762 volunteers, and almost 23,000 hours spent. There was, uh, I guess we'll just call it in 2019, there was a total of almost 52,000 FE exam takers. There was 100, almost 132,000 total engineering bachelor degrees awarded in 2018, which is kind of fascinating to me. And if you want to break that down further, we can. They go into talking about that the, um, let's look it over here, transition from pencil and paper to CBT. So for the FE exam, the makeup here is that they had 51,814 FE test takers in 2019, which is kind of surprising to me. Um, you know, you had 132,000 engineering bachelor's degrees awarded and 52, almost 52,000 FE test takers. So um, a lot of schools that are ABET accredited usually say that you cannot graduate without getting the FE done. So some schools, I guess, do not require that. Anyway, that was all CBT, so for the FE. For the PE exam, there was actually 904 computer-based PE exams issued this round and almost 30,000 pencil-based, pencil and paper. So the majority of those are obviously the civil exams. So a total of 30,521 total PE test takers. And they keep expanding the disciplines that offer PE license. Uh, I, th I think this started with civil engineering as being the majority of PE licenses, and it's definitely a must for civil engineers. But they, you know, you expand into mechanical, and now they got electrical disciplines and fire systems and all kinds of PE licenses that we'll talk about here shortly. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, pencil and paper exams for the SE exam, there was 2,400 people. That's actually a lot less than I thought would be taking the SE exam, but there was exactly 2,400 people that took the SE exam. Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, a conversion schedule. So if you are curious about going computer-based testing, because that is the way things are going these days. Uh, in 2020, they moved the PE fire protection over. 2020, they also moved the industrial and systems, the mechanical HVAC and refrigeration, the mechanical machine design and materials, the mechanical thermal fluid systems, and that was all converted to CBT in 2020. And then in 2021, you've got the PE agricultural that is moving over the electrical and computer for computer engineering, and then you got uh, PE electrical and computer electronics, controls and communications, and the PE electrical and computer power that's all moving to computer-based testing in 2021. And then also in 2021, PE mining and mineral processing. Whew. It's a lot of PE exams, a lot of different disciplines there. 2022, you get another conversion of PE exam test takers from architectural to control system to metallurgical to naval, and those go CBT in 2022. In 2023, which is what you guys care about uh, for civil engineers, is that is when the 
depth exams go computer based. So you got your civil, uh, construction, geotech, structural, transportation, and then water resources also goes there as well. And then in 2024, they save at the very end the structural SE exam. So there you go. That is, that'll complete the whole CBT uh, transition of things. It all started with the FE exam, and that would convert everything over to the computer based after 2024. So you'll see a lot of coursework. I mean, if you're going to take a review course, there's going to be some transition, I think, there. Uh, I'm sure they're going to come up with a new spec. And I'm sure they're going to come up with a new reference manual that will be the only thing that you can take with you to the exam because they're already doing that with the other exams. So something to look forward to. Something to look forward to. Let's take a look at the FE pass rates next. So if you are an FE test taker, um, it's designed for people that are in school or recent graduates. Um, that's kind of the purpose for that one. And it's the first step in becoming a professional engineer you have to take the FE to become a PE and so if we dive into that a little bit you can see here on YouTube um, I'll read these numbers uh, chemical engineers there was almost 2500 first-time test takers and pass rate of 75 percent pretty good pretty good volume of 235 repeat takers drops down to 40 percent okay the one we care about right now, if you are on this channel and what I'm involved with is the civil engineering one um, that definitely has the most with mechanical taking second place. But civil engineers, there was 15,473 test takers for the FE exam and 65% of you passed the first time. If you were a repeat taker, that dropped to 7,131 people and that drops to 34%. So those percentages are actually really close to the PE exam as well. Usually you bounce between like 65 and 70%. So, you know, FE test takers and also the PE test takers are very similar. They go further on this report and break this down to those that came from an ABET accredited college with, you know, an ABET bachelor's degree to find out what your percentage was compared to other examinees that did not have that it does bump up a little bit so if you're a first time taker that goes up to 67 percent if you came from an abet school and from other schools it drops to about 59 percent for first time taker so pretty interesting stuff um anyway go check that out uh let's this one's very interesting they talk about the top 10 universities by fe exam volume so they went through and they looked at all the universities who's sending the most students to take the FE exam. The number one college that is sending people to get to get the FE exam done is Missouri University of Science and Technology with 683 people. Number two is Texas A&M University with 550 people. And then you can just go down the list. There's Montana State, University of Colorado Boulder, California State Polytech University, North Carolina State University, Penn State, Washington State, University of Nevada, and lastly, the U.S. Military Academy. That is your top 10 colleges sending people to get the FE done. Kind of interesting. Um, and then they also break down, and this is very fascinating, uh, if I were to ask you guys what's the most popular time to take the FE exam, what would you say? Um, you know, I would say something like, well, it's it would follow the same thing as the PE exam is probably what it would do. So it'd be like spring and fall is probably what I think. But the truth is, is if you dive into the numbers based on the report, you get 21 per, about 22% of people taking it in the October to December window. This is broken up into four windows, basically once per quarter, right? Or in quarters, not once per quarter, but in quarters. So well, I'm going to skip that one. Let's start in January. So in January to March, you get 20 about 26 percent of you are taking the exam then in april to june it jumps up to 30 a little over 32 percent in july to september it drops all the way down to 20 percent and then october to december it's about 22 percent so the highest um, percentage of people taking the exam is actually falling into the april to june time frame and i really think the reason for that 
is because you are wrapping up school. A lot of people have either fewer classes in the summertime or they don't have any classes at all. So a lot of examinees, they're probably, a lot of students are probably thinking, I can cram and I can study for this in the summertime because I don't have any schoolwork. I don't have anything uh, pressing for my time. Or if I do, I only have like one or two classes, which is better than taking 18 credit hours or whatever during the normal, normal semester. So... Anyway, April to June is the most popular time to take the FE exam. Pretty interesting. All righty, let's jump to the good stuff now. So we're going to look at PE pass rates. So with PE pass rates, let's dive into this. This is some of the numbers I want to break down for you. Overall test takers, I'm not going to read all these for you because you're here for civil engineering. Uh, for civil engineering, for pass rates, if you took the construction exam for your depth exam, your first time taker, there was 1,572 people that took it in 2019, and they, as a first time taker, the pass rate was 55%. 55%. If you're a repeat taker, there was 1,400 people that were a repeat taker, and it dropped to 34%. What's that all about? Well, first thing I think is if if you're struggling with this and you need a review course, you need to go check out the course we developed, which is the Ultimate Civil PE Review Program. Go check that out at civilpereviewcourse.com. We can help you get there. But I think a lot of people that take the construction depth exam, uh, it's deceivingly hard because a lot of people think const the construction topic as a whole is relatively easy to understand. And a lot of people do it because it's not super discipline specific. But the truth is, is it it goes into every single like discipline, and a lot of a lot of problems are very hard because I want, I'm not going to say they're tricky, but they're worded difficult. Um, they're just harder problem to solve, a little more wordy. Uh, so anyway, you got to watch out for that. A lot of people think that construction depth exam is the easiest one to take, and it's not. So it's not the most popular one as I'll go through this, but it does have the lowest percentage for people that passed it the first time. So just be aware of that. Next one up here is geotech. If you were a geotech depth taker, uh, there was 1,048 people that took that pass rate of 63% for first time takers. If you're a repeat taker, there were 747 of you and it dropped all the way down to 34%. If you took civil structural, there was 2,978 people. That was the second most popular, no, third most popular exam. Uh, so with structural, your first time test taker, there was a 62% pass rate. And if a, you were a repeat taker, it dropped down to 43%. Transportation, first time test taker, there was 3,131 people and a pass rate of 63% for first time test taker. And then if you're a repeat taker, it dropped all the way down to 41%. And then if you took water resources, this is the most popular exam that was taken in 2019. Uh, and would you guys ever guess that? I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have guessed transportation. Typically, that's really high. Um, a lot of people like transportation just because um, a lot of the answers come right out of the standards that you're bringing with you. And so... Um, that's why I think that's a very popular exam. But uh, there's also a lot of transportation engineers in general. So anyway, water resources is a good one to take too because it doesn't require any standards to take. So you're not going to have to bring in volumes of books. Anyway, that is the most popular exam at 3,241 people for first-time test takers. And the pass rate was 66%, which is the best pass rate for all of those. And as a repeat taker, it dropped down to 41%. So... What are the takeaways here? I think the takeaway here is that if you are a first time test taker, that's your very best possible chance of passing the PE exam. So make sure you're giving it your all if you are trying to study for the PE exam. Uh, that's just the truth. So uh, take a course, you know, get material, get your books in order, set a schedule, get everything you need to do, get ready to roll. Um, like I said, if you need a course, go check out the one we created. And uh, that's at civilpereviewcourse.com. Go check it out. Um, yeah, Water Resource is the winner there. So good stuff. Let's dive more into this report here a little bit. 
I mean, they got so many PE people now. It's crazy. I'm sure that's going to expand. It's just go- growing like crazy with the the offerings that they have. You got everything from fire protection down to software and petroleum and naval ar- architecture. So, uh, yeah, all kinds of people. The lowest amount of test takers looks to be in software. I don't think that's a. It must be a growing industry to get your PE in software. I'm wondering why people get it if they are in software. What that, what that says, what that does for you. Uh, there were 16 first-time test takers. So, anyway, <laughs> if you're if you're a software guy, I'm interested why you took it. it. Must be good on your resume for sure. Um, diving more into the report, they break into PE pass rates versus experience and so this is kind of interesting so if you have between zero and five years of experience your pass rates are actually pretty low and what this looks like is just kind of a bell curve um, with the highest possible chance of passing the exam at five years of experience so this kind of falls in line with what individual states usually require which is four years of working experience before you can take or get your receive your your PE license but based on what they're showing uh, it kind of matches that so if you have five years of experience you have your highest highest possible chance of passing and it looks just like a bell curve uh, as you can see Um, but yeah five years of experience is the highest and then the other thing that's kind of interesting about this little bell curve is that if you have 11 plus years of experience your pass rate jumps all the way up to as if you had five years of experience so I think people with 11 plus years of experience uh, are studying harder for this thing or studying just as much as those that had five years of experience because because it shoots way up so that's kind of interesting so uh, yeah definitely check that one out Let's look at the next thing they break down is the PE structural pass rates. Uh, the SE exam, if you don't if you don't know, is the professional engineering exam designed for engineers who practice in in uh, jurisdiction jurisdictions that license structural engineers separately from other professional engineers. So this particular exam is a 16-hour exam, and it's broken up into two different exams. They separate it into vertical and lateral components to test and examine these abilities to safely design buildings or bridges. So you have four different categories here. You have structural lateral forces with bridges. You have structural lateral lateral forces with buildings. You have structural vertical forces with bridges and structural vertical forces with buildings. And that's a mouthful. Okay. Whew. So. Overall test takers, the volume of this is pretty low. The majority of people are doing buildings. So, uh, but if you took bridges, lateral bridges, it was 75 people, first time takers, and pass rate of only 21%. Repeat taker dropped to 33%, so a little higher. Uh, These are kind of interesting because they actually go up as a repeat taker. Um, For structural lateral forces buildings, you had 519, that's the most popular. And that went to, for a first-time taker, it was 38%. A repeat taker dropped to 32%. Um, For structural vertical force bridges, first-time takers was 83 of you. And that was at 35% pass rate. And it went up to 43% as a repeat taker. And then another popular exam, again, just going with buildings. So majority of people are taking the building exam. And for structural vertical forces, that was 623 people. First time takers was 42%. And then it dropped as a repeat taker, 28%. So that was the only one that looks like it, well, not not the only one, but that was one that dropped as repeat takers. A lot of information, a lot of data. Hopefully this isn't boring you, but I do find it interesting going through these numbers, like how many people took it, what were the pass rates, and I think those are you know, kind of eye-opening, especially if you're taking one of these exams. Uh, Another interesting fact is that the average age of examinees by exam type, if I were to ask you guys what the average age is for those taking the PE, let's start with the structural exam, what would you guess? 
I would not guess this. The average age is about 36 years old. And for those that take the PE exam, the average age looks to be like 33, 33. And then for the FE exam, I thought this would be much younger, but the average age looks to be like 27 years old. So that's crazy to me. So ages, are, in my mind, I thought would be a lot younger, but they're actually older. So uh, we're older taking these exams. And that's the breakdown for that guy. Um, I'm not going to get into FS pass rates or surveying pass rates. You can go check those out if you are interested in that. Uh, they break down a lot of the information for uh, people that want a NCEES record and have your PE license um, and trying to get licenses in other states. They talk about that. Uh, I'm talking about more mobility for licensure. Um, they're trying to advance mobility by perform performing more uh, uniform national exams, model laws, and rules. And so with their records program, they're trying to do a better job at that. And they kind of break down the number of transmittables per record holder. So that's kind of interesting. Go check that out. Uh, another interesting fact, I think, is uh, they break down the countries by number of credentials uh, per applicant, okay? The top 10. So these are the different uh, countries outside of the U.S. of students that are trying to take, that are taking the PE exam and becoming a licensed engineer. So administered nationally, internationally, I mean, there was 2,334 FE exam test takers. That's pretty cool. And there was 570 FE exam test takers. So that's very interesting to me. I know a lot of people in our audience um, are international. And so they're always questioning like how they register for this exam or if their experience or the college that they attended can count towards this. And it can't. So just breaking it down, they say that the U.S. licensing boards generally require licensed candidates with degrees from non abet accredited programs to have their education evaluated. So you do have to go through that when you're applying. Most of these candidates are from other countries. And the credential evaluation basically provides a valuable service to help boards ensure that candidates are qualified academically for licensure. They're not just going to let anybody take this exam. And so they got to compare what you've done if you are international to what like an ABA school uh, does and see if those things kind of match up. So it also states that as a number as the number of ABA accredited programs outside the U.S. has increased in recent years, so has interest in these exams. And so currently this exam, uh, they have agreements with foreign entities in Canada, Egypt, uh, the Emirate of Shar Sharjah, I think that's how you say it, Japan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Taiwan, Turkey. That's crazy. It's all over the place now. So your top 10 countries, here you go. Top 10 countries is India. 475 people, Egypt, 246 people, China, 225 people, and then it goes South Korea, Iran, uh, Philippines, um, United States, I guess this is people with international degrees here in the U.S., um, Canada, Iraq, and Jordan. So that's your top 10. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. I think that's crazy. That's cool. So the whole thing is kind of getting a little more international as well. Uh, licensure in general. If I were to say where you're from and what state you're from, and could you tell me how many PE licenses you had there or how many engineers you have there? So they break all this down in, in the report. I'm not going to dive into all 50 states. I'll just hit some of the highlights. I think you can dive in there and check it out yourself. Just go read the report. Um, it looks to me, just looking through this real quick, do, 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 do. The highest number of engineers, at least that I can see, maybe I'm blind here, uh, is Texas. You've got 38,237 resident, 20,062 non-resident in Texas. Wow, a lot of engineers there. The lowest, uh, what's the lowest? I don't know. Uh, 
New Mexico, North Dakota. Um, no, yeah, North Dakota. I don't know. You go read the report. You guys go read the report. Anyway, it breaks down engineers, surveyors, and engineers and surveyors with a dual license. They track down how many people are in your state that are engineers, how many are resident and non-resident. That's a lot of interesting stats. They also break down engineering licenses by year. So it's grown. In 1937, there was 40, almost 47,000 engineering licenses. And we're going to jump all the way to, let's say, year 2000. There were 669,000 licenses. Wow. And then they track all the way up to 2004. There were 750,000 licenses in 2004. And it just continues to grow. Whew. Crazy. They break up surveying licenses as well. And guys, that's pretty much the whole report. So it's a that's a really neat report. It gives a lot of data. Something that you should definitely go check out. Hopefully this was insightful to you as it was for me. It lets me know like the average age of people taking exams, the pass rates, how many engineers are out there in the states, and how many international people are actually taking this exam. So I really do enjoy these reports. It's really kind of a fun report that they do. Uh, like I said, it's kind of graphically uh you know, visually pleasing to the eye. It's kind of a fun report, but a lot of data and a, and a lot of good of information. So hopefully this was insightful to you as it was for me. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, if you haven't earned your FE license or haven't got your EIT, go check out the course we've built for the, for you to pass that. It's the ultimate civil FE review course, and that's at civilfereviewcourse.com. And if you need your PE license, go get the course we built for that. The ultimate civil PE review uh, course, and that's at civilpereviewcourse.com, and uh, it's good stuff there too. So if you're looking to pass the FE or you're looking to pass the PE, there's going to be something that we have for you. We also have tons of resources for you just at civilengineeringacademy.com. Uh, you can go get practice exams. We've got free problems on YouTube if you just need to practice tons of problems, and we're always putting more on there. As much as uh, you know, we can. We obviously have more in the course, but uh, we want to definitely keep YouTube going and keep problems on there for people. So, anyway, guys, hopefully this was valuable to you as it was for me. Hope you enjoyed this, and uh, if you haven't checked it out, go to nces.org and go grab the report. Check out those numbers because I do think they're interesting. Anyway, we will uh, see you on the next one. Bye.